In this study, we're going to see what Jesus said about health. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's where Christ dwells within us. And like with all other things in Scripture, we have ways that we need to live, things that we need to do in order to follow Christ. He doesn't leave us in the dark about our bodies, about our health. And in this study, we're going to see just what Jesus has to say about this. When God created man, he did not create him to die. God created man to live for eternity. People have spent their entire lives studying the human anatomy. God made it so incredible and so wonderful. Listen to what the psalmist had to say about it. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. Have you ever considered such a thing as your eye, the fact that you can see things in colour, and that you don't just see them in black and white? Have you considered your ear and the fact that you can hear high notes and low notes, that you don't hear them all at the same level? How wonderfully God created and made us! But even when man sinned and death came upon the whole human race, even then people lived a long, long time. Adam lived to be 930 years old. It says that his son Seth lived to be 912 years old. Then we come to the man who lived the longest of any individual, and that was Methuselah, who lived to be 969. Just think about that. And then we come to Noah, and the Bible says Noah lived to be 950 years old. Have you ever thought about that? That in the life of two men you have 1880 years. From Adam, who lived to be 930 years old. Adam lived from the time of creation to Noah, and Noah lived from that time to the time of Abraham. So in the lifespan of two men you have 1880 years. And then by the time we reach Abraham, the Bible tells us that Abraham lived to be 175 years old and died at that good old age. But that's not very good compared with 950. By the time we reach King David, David had this to say. The days of our lives are 70 years. And if by reason of strength they are eighty years, yet their boast is only labour and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. David said that if we live seventy years we've done quite well, and if by the grace of God we reach eighty, we can thank God for that. We don't live very long, compared with how they lived back then. But God still wants us to be healthy and happy. He wants us to enjoy life. Jesus said that he came to give us life, and he came to give it to us more abundantly. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. You see, the Lord wants you and I to enjoy life. He doesn't want us to go around sad all the time. Very much like the story of the man that got off the train, and there was a lady giving out literature, and she handed him a piece of literature, and he read a little of it, looked at her, read a little more, and gave it back to her and said, Well, it looks like you need this more than I do. And that's not what God wants in our lives. He came to make us happy. He came to give us health and life. This is what he wants us to have. And in John it tells us, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. And that's what God wants us to have. He doesn't want us to go around sick. That's not God's desire. That's not his will. And he's given us some simple things in his word to help us to be healthy and help us to be happy. Before Jesus ascended back to heaven, he gave us a promise concerning the Holy Spirit. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter, that he may abide with you for ever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you, and will be in you. Now that becomes very, very important when it comes to this question of health and what Jesus has to say about health. The fact that he said he would give us the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit would dwell in us, that is the promise that he made. And now it says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and you are not your own. The scripture says that our body is a temple, and that is where the Holy Spirit dwells in us. 
and it says that we need to be very careful how we treat the temple of God, because it goes on to say, For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Our body and our spirit belong to him. You see, we belong to the Lord twice. He made us. He made us fearfully and wonderfully. Secondly, he bought us, he redeemed us. So we really belong to him twice. And it says that you and I need to be very careful how we treat and care for our bodies. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? You see, here it tells us that the Spirit of God dwells in us. And if anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy. Which temple you are? So it says that the temple of God is holy, which means that our body is holy, because the Holy Spirit dwells in it. And it says that you and I are to keep as healthy as we possibly can for the Lord. Jesus said, it's not what goes in that matters. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth. This is what defiles a man. Now what is this trying to say? Well, that we can be very meticulous about our health. We can practice all kinds of health reform. We can take care of our body and make sure that it's cared for in every way. But that won't save us. You see, if our hearts are not right, then we are just like white-walled sepulchres or tombs, white on the outside, but inside full of dead men's bones. And this doesn't help us. That's what Jesus is trying to get across. So we can practice all kinds of health reform, but if our hearts are not right, then this won't do us any good. But just because that won't do us any good, does not mean that if our hearts are right, that we shouldn't keep our body right, because our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and we need to keep it as healthy as we can for the Lord. And that's what he's trying to tell us. Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So it's making it very clear here in God's word that what we eat, what we drink, the things that we do, we are to do all of it to the glory of God. That's what he wants us to do. He wants us to be careful. Why? Because our body is his, and also because it has an effect on our spiritual condition. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now it gives us some advice here in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 17. Therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. So God simply says that you and I are not to take into our bodies anything that is unclean. And the scripture gives us a list of things that are not clean and says that we are not to put those things into our bodies. It talks about it here. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So he says he's our God. He will walk and be with us and that we are to care for our bodies as best we can. Now you need to listen carefully as it talks about certain things that we can eat and certain things that we should not eat. It says... Speak to the children of Israel, saying, These are the animals which you may eat among all the animals that are on the earth. Now he's talking about what we can eat and what we can't. And you know, every time we read that text, somebody will say, Oh, that's just for the Jews. That's for the children of Israel. That's not for us. Well, the only difference between a Jew's stomach and ours is that ours might be a little smaller or bigger. So when he's talking about what we eat, then this does apply to us as well as to them. So let's see what he has to say about it. Among the animals, whatever divides the hoof, having cloven hooves and chewing the cud, that you may eat. So it says when it comes to animals, they must have two characteristics. Firstly, they must have a divided hoof. And secondly, they must chew the cud. Those are the two things they must have in order to be clean. Now he starts enumerating which animals are clean and which aren't. 
Nevertheless, these you shall not eat among those that chew the cud or those that have cloven hooves. The camel, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. So it says, don't eat the camel. It chews the cud, but it does not have a divided hoof. So don't eat it, it's unclean. It continues on. The rock hyrax, or the rock badger, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. So he says, don't eat that one either. The hare, or rabbit, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. So it says, leaves the rabbit alone, don't eat it. And the swine, the pig, though it divides the hoof, having cloven hooves yet does not chew the cud, is unclean to you. God said, leave it alone, I did not make it to be eaten. Their flesh you shall not eat, and their carcasses you shall not touch, they are unclean to you. God is saying these are not animals that are made for human consumption. Now when it comes to sea life, what lives in the ocean and the sea, God has this to say. These you may eat of all that are in the water. Whatever in the water has fins and scales, whether in the seas or in the rivers, that you may eat. So again the scripture says they must have two characteristics. They must have fins and scales. The land animals must have two characteristics and sea life must have two characteristics, fins and scales, in order to be clean. But all in the seas or in the rivers that do not have fins and scales, all that move in the water or any living thing which is in the water, they are an abomination to you. So it's simply saying that such things as eels, swordfish, shark, squid, and shellfish such as lobster, crabs, prawns and oysters, all those are unclean. They were made as scavengers to clean up the bottom of the ocean and the ponds and rivers. That's what they were made for. Now when we come to the birds and fowl, God does not give us a rule. He just names them here in Leviticus, the 11th chapter, and he says, And these you shall regard as an abomination among the birds. They shall not be eaten. They are an abomination the eagle, the vulture, the buzzard. Most of the birds named are birds of prey, and God says, don't eat them. Now, if you take a look at them, they're not a very inviting list. You see, they are not made for human consumption, and God has said, leave them alone, don't eat them, because they're unclean. Now, they found out a very interesting thing back in the state of Wyoming many years ago. They had a real problem because in the spring when the snow melted and the ranchers turned the cattle out, the rattlesnakes would also come out, and they would lay there sunning themselves, and they would strike the cattle and kill them. So they started to try to do something about this, and they had rattlesnake hunts. Today they have hardly any rattlesnakes there. They solved their problem. Not with rattlesnake hunts. They didn't get very far with that. But they happened to notice that if a rattlesnake struck a pig, it didn't affect it. So every spring they turned herds of pigs out, and the pigs would go through and eat up the rattlesnakes. You see, a rattlesnake can strike a pig several times, and it won't affect it, because the pig has more poison in it than the rattlesnake does. You see, they don't have sweat glands. They have a very, very poor system of eliminating poison out of their body. So the pigs would eat the rattlesnakes, and then we would go and eat the pigs. And today you may not have the problem of pigs eating rattlesnakes, but they just feed on all the rubbish and scavenge in the mud. And God says, don't eat them, leave them alone, they're not clean. They're unclean and we are not to eat them. He promises that you and I will be much better off if we don't eat these things. Scripture goes on to say, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Now listen carefully. And every one who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest, when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. 
Throughout life, there are times when we need to control ourselves, and that's certainly true when it comes to what we eat. We need to discipline ourselves to keep our bodies in subjection. We need to do this in order to live healthier lives. That's what the scripture tells us that we are to do. Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods. But God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. You see, it says there are two types of people. There are some people who just live to eat and there are some people that just eat to live. You see, it says you and I are to keep our bodies in subjection, to care for it. From a baby placed in the high chair with a tray in front of it, and we've all seen babies, they pick up the food and they squash the food on the tray and they pop it into their mouths, and then we grow up thinking that anything we can get our hands on is okay to eat. But that's not true. We should be careful about what we eat, what we take into our bodies. Hear, my son, and be wise, and guide your heart in the way. Do not mix with wine bibblers or with gluttonous eaters of meat. You see, it says that you and I are not to do that, that we are to be careful how we treat the temple of God, our bodies. That is a counsel that the Lord gives us. For the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, and drowsiness will clothe a man with rags. So God gives us some very, very clear counsel. Now there are some other things that we should look at, because sometimes we miss the picture. It makes it very clear that we need to be careful what we take into our bodies, especially when it comes to poisonous herbs. You remember Jesus hanging on the cross, and it says that they offered him gall. They gave him a drink of wine mixed with a drug called gall. When he tasted it, he refused to drink it. Gel is a poisonous herb, and the Bible makes it clear that you and I are not to take a poisonous herb into our bodies. We need to be very careful what we use. We live in an age where people have become chemically dependent. The use of tobacco, for example. Tobacco is a poisonous herb. Tobacco has 19 poisons in it, and nicotine happens to be the worst one. How strong is nicotine? Well, you can take the nicotine out of one cigarette... Not one pack, just one cigarette, and put it into a syringe, inject it into your artery, and you would be dead. The only reason it doesn't kill you when you smoke is because you assimilate it into your bloodstream slowly. God says leave it alone. Don't take that into your body. You are to keep your body healthy. You are to keep your body as a temple of God. It gives us that counsel. Christ, when he was faced with that situation, would not take it into his body. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. The scripture gives us clear counselling on the use of alcohol, that we are not to take it into our bodies. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? He's making it clear here who is not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. He lists drunkards right there with them, and it says that you and I are not to drink and to take that into our bodies. There's only one kind of temperance when it comes to alcohol, and that's total abstinence. All you have to do is talk to a few pastors and they can tell you very clearly what happens. Family after family totally wrecked. And God says, leave it alone. Listen to the counsel of the Lord. Do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. In other words, it says, when it is fermented, leave it alone, don't use it. At the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. In fact, the scripture simply says that if you use it, then you're not very smart. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. It simply says, leave it alone. It's telling us that all of us would be much, much healthier if we stayed away from what the Bible lists as unclean meats, if we left tobacco alone and alcohol alone, 
it would probably reduce our medical expenses by around 70% if we just did those things. You see, Jesus Christ lived a life that was completely in harmony with nature's laws. And today we want to share with you eight things that Jesus did, that if you would do these things, it would change your whole life for the better. It would make you healthy and help you to enjoy life if you just did these things. These are the things that Jesus did. Firstly, fresh air. Jesus spent his life outside in the fresh air. When you read the Bible, you don't find Jesus cooped up in some building all the time. You find him out in the fresh air. You and I need to get outside more, into the fresh air. Just get outside and walk and breathe deeply. Let us share what may seem like a silly thing to you, but it will make a great, great difference. It will help your breathing if you just do it. As you get outside and walk, just pretend that your legs are hollow, and as you walk, try to suck up the air through your legs, and it will pull the air right into your lungs where it belongs. Now if you haven't had anything down there for thirty years, then it will probably make you cough a little as well, but you'll get over that and you'll learn to breathe as you should. And the fresh air will help you tremendously if you will just do it. Jesus spent his time out in the fresh air. Secondly, sunshine. You'll find that time after time when Jesus got all the people together, he would have them sit down on the grass out in the sunshine. So get some sunshine. It will make all the difference in the world. It has healing qualities. Now we know sometimes that seems almost impossible with the change in our summers. But when we are blessed with the sun, then try and get out in it. Thirdly, water. These are simple things which don't cost you anything. Over and over Jesus spoke about it. As he went to Samaria and met the woman at the well, he said, give me a drink. He used water. It's very necessary to drink water. It's tremendously healthy for you. You need to drink water every day. It will make a tremendous difference to you if you do. Also, Jesus spent all of his time outside walking. Exercise. You need to get exercise. You won't really be healthy unless you do exercise. And Jesus went everywhere and walked and exercised. The best exercise in the world is walking. You need to get out and walk about three miles each day. And if you say you don't have time to walk three miles a day, then run. But you need to get out and exercise. It's vital to your health, and it will help you tremendously. Jesus also did something that is very, very healthful, and that concerned rest. You know, when the disciples had been out and they had travelled to different places and worked, Jesus said, come aside and rest a while. So Jesus was very conscious that you need to rest. Sleep. You need to get your sleep. And you know yourself better than anyone else how much sleep you need. Some people get by fine on six hours. Some people need seven. And some need eight hours. You know what's right for you, what you need. You need to rest and get the rest that's required. Then also, as we've mentioned, Jesus lived a life in conformity with what God's word says concerning diet. Jesus lived in perfect agreement with what the scriptures had to say about what he ate. He did not eat what was unclean. You don't ever find him taking into his body a poisonous herb. And by the way, when it speaks of him using wine, it's not talking about fermented, intoxicating wine. You see, they had several wines. They had sweet wine that was not intoxicating. Jesus lived a life in complete conformity with what the Word of God says concerning diet, and you and I need to do the same thing. He also went through life, and we can't emphasize this enough, with trust. Trust in divine aid. Now we live in a time when there is great, great stress, and you are not going to handle that stress unless you learn to depend upon him, to trust him. We can tell you that we know people who practice good health, but they don't come to this part of trusting in God. And science will tell you that nothing contributes more and more to heart failure, to cancer, and to sickness in general, 
than not being able to handle stress. And if you learn to trust in divine aid, it will make a great, great difference in your life. Jesus came to give you life. He came to break the things that bind us and hold us. He had this to say. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the broken-hearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed. That's what Jesus came to do, to set you and me free. Today, if you're a captive, if you're a captive to tobacco, if you're a captive to alcohol, if you're a captive to drugs, or to any other thing, Jesus Christ came to set you free. That's what he came for. He can give you deliverance when no one else can. Just simply the touch of Jesus Christ can make you whole. Will you let him set you free today?